district was very interested in what was happening um, at WIPO and what WIPO has been doing in um, various countries ar around the continent. And in 2007, WIPO member states agreed to the development uh, agenda. And one of the recommendations, recommendation 34, uh, was that WIPO, member states recommended that WIPO engage in study of the role of intellectual property in innovation in informal sectors. Now, our project wasn't content to sit back and wait for WIPO to do the studies themselves, so we decided to engage in intellectual property innovation in the informal sectors early. We got, we, we got started in 2009 and 2010 designing some studies. It was a huge challenge because methodologically it's much different than anything that had been done before. Uh, and earlier we heard some discussion about the kind of metrics that you're looking for when trying to capture and measure innovation in the informal sector. Well, uh, to WIPO's great credit, it, uh, uh, member states approved an implementation project designed to look at the same topic. And what we saw were two parallel uh, projects, a WIPO Development Agenda Implementation Project and our IDRC and GIZ funded project um, merged together, really. So uh, I was fortunate enough to be a part of that project. So was uh, Dick Kawuya, Georgia Segbe, and Erica Kramer and Bula. Uh, Chris Bull uh, led a study in Nairobi. He couldn't be here. And that project was led by Sasha wunsch uh, who uh, unfortunately also couldn't be here. So it's in that context that I thought we could discuss the intersections between these two projects and start to explore the role intellectual property does play in innovation in informal sectors. So I'd, I'd like to invite uh, Dick to say a few words first, and then Eric Erica and George um, to make a presentation of this, their study findings, and then we'll open it up for discussion, time permitting. All right, thank you, Jeremy, and uh, good to see you again. Um, in this book, there are two chapters that specifically talk about informal sector, at least in the title. And um, one of them, obviously, is the conceptual chapter, I think chapter two, and the second one is mine, uh, which is looking at sort of the intersection between formal and informal sectors in um, uh, Uganda's automotive industry. Um, when they invited case study uh, proposals uh, as part of the open air project, I specifically put proposal focusing on informal sector and IP, uh, partly because of what was happening at WIPO, but also because of uh, what I think uh, major demographic changes happening in this continent. Um, when you look at what has happened since we started this project, uh, there's been the World Bank report, 2013, which is simply titled Jobs. And that report specifically identifies Sub-Saharan Africa and many other developing countries as facing a huge challenge around employment or lack of employment for young people. And uh, the informal sector has sort of become a destination for many young people, whether trained, you know, highly educated in universities, or those without any kind of formal training. So for me, it is a matter of practical uh, implications for Africa. You, you simply cannot afford to ignore what is actually happening in the informal sector. Um, so because of that, I thought, we needed to really understand the intersection between IP, innovation, and the informal sector. And at the time, uh, the question was whether we study informal sector, understand innovation and IP in there, or we understand the intersection between formal and the informal sector. Again, as a matter of uh, practical uh, public policy, um, uh, 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 you know, question, uh, how do you study the informal sector without understanding how it intersects with the public sector. Because uh, obviously what we've seen, at least in the literature, is that a lot of scholars have looked at the informal sector, what people are doing, the scope, how to measure, what it is. Uh, and uh, oftentimes, those reports are simply ignored. Because the folks in the public sector, or in the formal sector, especially in the government, they simply don't understand what it is. How relevant is it? except on those occasions when they need to go to collect taxes, so to speak, mm -hmm. right? And uh, actually, in my study, the, the artisans I talked to told me our only relationship with the, the government is when they come to collect taxes. So uh, I think uh, because of those reasons, 
we needed to understand what the informal sector is and um, uh, its sort of contribution to socioeconomic development, but most important, how IP plays out in the relationship between formal and informal sectors. Um, obviously, since we started this project, a lot has changed. I obviously talked about the World Bank report. WIPO has rec adopted the recommendations, and of course the project they supported. Uh, but also, what I thought was interesting in the evolution of this project, and certainly the case studies that were implemented, was the change of mindset. I remember the opening, you know, your uh, uh, workshop we had here in Cape Town. A lot of folks were sort of talking about all these different areas, you know, um, about around traditional medicine, about, you know, um, um, patents, uh, and all these different areas that the different case studies we are looking at. And the informal sector was not necessarily on their radar. Uh, but in the last two years, I've seen a number of case study proponents, uh, in one way or another, talk about sort of the informal sector implications of their case studies. Uh, many of them have done interviews, and in many ways, they link back to the informal sector. So I think when you think about IP innovation in this, on this continent, and certainly beyond, I think this is the question that we are not going to be able to escape. So briefly, those are my opening remarks, and I'll be happy to. Thank you very, very much, Dick. Uh, so Erica Kramer Ambula is at Shwani University of Technology, and she was instrumental in her Center uh, for um, Economic Research and Innovation, was instrumental in supporting a workshop that uh, WIPO held in Pretoria uh, roughly a year ago, almost to, to the week. Um, and so in addition to being the host of this, um, this workshop, uh, Erica is an author of a case study um, under the WIPO project uh, looking at a particular area of the informal economy in South Africa. And so I'd invite her to make a few comments. And we could bring the clicker over to, um, to you, I think, and get okay. your slides loaded up. Basically, the, the case study that we did in, a, for, uh, in, a, in the institute that was dealing with the with informal economy, we chose the sector of um, personal and home care products. Um, basically, just to give you a, a flavor of, uh, of what we found, there's a wealth of data that we managed to collect. Um, but basically, uh, the approach, uh, what I would like to emphasize is that we adopted a systemic approach on how we are going to look at, uh, at these informal manufacturers. Basically, we understood that uh, to understand the behavior of informal uh, manufacturers or entrepreneurs, you cannot just look at the informal entrepreneurs themselves, but the system in, in, the, in which they operate, the context of other organizations, how they interact with the formal organizations, with regulations, with the regulatory framework, and with each other as well. Um, so that's basically the, the, um, the, the approach that we adopted. Um, uh, basically, with the, I, can, I can't read the slides, but uh, oh, I can read them. Uh, basically, the objectives of the study, I'm not going to go through them, but was basically trying to map who are the key actors in this innovation system and understand a little bit more the innovations, the nature of the innovations, where are the obstacles, uh, how they learn, how they change knowledge, and the technology transfer that may take place uh, with formal and informal organizations. And uh, through, by understanding that, we also wanted to understand the, uh, the mechanisms <laughs> I've, been, I've been, yes, yes. <laughs> and this is just the beginning. Um, understanding the mechanisms of uh, knowledge appropriation and the, the role that IP can, can play in that context. Um, basically, uh, there are different, there's this idea that the informal economy is smaller in South Africa than in other countries, and uh, although it may be true, uh, we, un we also understand that there's a 25% unemployment, um, uh, well, that's one of the estimations, um, uh, in South Africa. And a lot of people are uh, uh, basically having a livelihood, uh, finding a livelihood in the informal economy. Uh, we found uh, that in the case of personal and home care, home care products, there have been estimations of around 60,000. Uh, uh, companies, but uh, we saw well, in a, through our field work, we actually understood that this was a, a growing, a growing sector. Uh, we're talking about people uh, manufacturing cosmetics, toiletries, perfumes, um, uh, oral care, foam bath, 
uh, in terms of personal care products and, uh, or dishwashing liquid, bleach, uh, air fresheners, floor polish. There's a range of products, a really big range of products. Um, some of them living in formal uh, settlements, some of them uh, operate in metropolitan areas. Uh, but basically what, what, I, what I was trying to, uh, to explain earlier is that the informal manufacturers don't exist by themselves, but they, they interact at very different stages of the production uh, and distribution chain with, uh, with uh, formal manufacturers and, and formal organizations. This is just to give you um, um, a flavor of some of the interactions that, that we found um, in, uh, in obtaining raw materials, in packaging, in manufacturing itself, in distributing their product in different places. Um, uh, we found a range of innovations uh, that go that go from uh, packaging, process innovations, pro uh, product innovations, uh, and distribution, and also in terms of technology. I won't go through them, but just to give you an idea, um, in terms of the, the, the main character characteristics of innovation, we found that most inno innovations are incremental. So basically, they're, <laughs> they're just, not. Uh, just get them to shut the door uh, <laughs> there. <a while. laughs> Thanks. So you can continue. Uh, they are usually not new to the world, or they are not new to the industry itself, but they are new to the firm or to, to the manufacturer himself or herself. Um, uh, in many cases, they are reactive innovations. Uh, so they respond to customer needs or to, to, uh, to the changes that go on in the, in the supplier chain. And, uh, but we also found cases of proactive innovations, basically uh, informal entrepreneurs trying to reach out to a wider market uh, uh, through different means by introducing uh, new packaging or adding healing, pro healing properties to some of the creams or, or, uh, or cosmetics and so on. And also we found innovation was collaborative. Basically, informal manufacturers don't have the resources to do R&D, so they have to talk to each other, they have to interact. Interaction and collaboration is key for innovation in the informal uh, sector. Uh, and finally, um, oop, something happened. Um, finally, in terms of uh, knowledge appropriation, um, I will, I will take just uh, 30 seconds to go through this because maybe it will come up uh, through, the, through the discussion. But the uh, formal mechanisms of knowledge appropriation are, hard, are, hardly, um, are hardly found. Um, oh, dear. OK, technology is definitely not my strength. <laughs> Formal, uh, formal mechanisms of knowledge appropriation, like patents, copyright, uh, uh, trademarks, are not used. Uh, <laughs> are not used uh, uh, in the in the informal sector. Um, and basically, let me just conclude by saying that uh, that there are other rules that that uh, guide and um, that guide the, the sharing of information and knowledge and learning in the in the informal sector. And for a series, uh, if the IP framework wants to sort of embrace the informal economy, I think it's very important to reach out and try to understand better through evidence-based uh, 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 assessment which are the avenues uh, of. Uh, of broadening up the, the range of instruments available for the informal economy. Um, I will just leave the rest for the discussion. Oh, that, that's you. excellent. We'll come back to this in a, in a few minutes um, after we've heard from George. But, but particularly interesting is your observation that many of these innovations are not new to the world, but they're new to the firm or to the entrepreneur or to the region. Hmm. And of course, that's the key difference between an invention and an innovation. Often these words are conflated and used synonymously, but they're, they're clearly not. And mm -hmm. so we see a sector here that is very innovative by definition and widely accepted definitions mm -hmm. where patent, they're not eligible for patent protection because it doesn't meet the legal requirements. Okay. And to hear you talk about um, collaboration because they, uh, entrepreneurs lack the, the resources to do the things themselves, they operate in a system. Well, this is the definition of open innovation that you know management scholars in the United States are now heralding as the next revolution. Uh, well, I guess it's not really the next revolution any, anymore, but 10 years ago it was. And so to see this emerging from you know the informal sectors, innovation has always been open hmm. in those sectors. So that's very interesting. Uh, so George is conducting a parallel study in, in Ghana. Uh, George is with the Council on Scientific and Industrial Research. He's also got some slides. I don't know if those are, are up yet. Um, but this is, this is very interesting. His study is on traditional healers. I'll let him tell you uh, about that as he gets it set up. 
But traditional knowledge yeah. is, a, is an overarching theme of uh, both the book and, uh, yes, and the week's yeah. events. We have a track dedicated to issues of tra traditional knowledge. Um, Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, we'll talk a lot about traditional knowledge. Uh, both this afternoon, we have a panel on it. And tomorrow, it's, it's one of our key scenarios. So what's very interesting, I think, about what George will say is the intersections between traditional knowledge governance and uh, informality in the informal economy. George. Thank you very much. And um, I would like to say that with another study, we decided to go into the traditional herbal medicine sector. And we thought that it's, um, it, it's illustrative of the kinds of um, um, uh, sector that you would want to look at in terms of the issues that we are studying. And um, I have the same questions as um, Erica had tried to answer, beginning with the national innovation system of the traditional herbal medicine sector. In other words, who are the actors there? What are the actor linkages that are there? The knowledge flows and all that. Um, what are the drivers and inhibitors of innovation? In any case, is innovation happening in traditional medicine at all? Um, and what's the nature of innovation? And then we also would want to look at the intellectual property system. To what extent is it facilitating innovation in traditional herbal medicine? And um, is there any inhibition at all? Is, is it relevant for traditional herbal medicine. And then we also, um, in the study, looked at the uh, issues of improvement in terms of um, what policy impacts are there, and therefore the policies are making improvements in the traditional herbal medicine practice. And of course, most importantly, going back to the Agenda 34 that Jeremy talked about, to what extent can we shape the national policies and programs to be able to enhance the impact of um, IP on innovations and on specifically, in our case, traditional herbal medicine. So these are the underlining um, um, questions. What I've done here is just try to summarize the questions, but of course there are um, a whole lot of other related questions. And if I may go to, looks like, I would also have the same challenges mm -hmm. with technology, but uh, if I may go to the findings, one of the important points I need to emphasize here has to do with the continuum you would find in the informal economy with respect to traditional medicine. You find that we have the very basic traditionalists practitioner who is maybe hiding in a hut there. I believe you can see the first picture. Mm -hmm. um, and just practicing his um, traditional medicine. And uh, I believe that when we talk about traditional medicine, that's the first picture that comes to your mind. But then move to the middle picture, and you, re you realize that there's this gentleman, and he's bottled some concoctions, and mm -hmm. he's selling. Is also a traditional medical practitioner. And then you go up. There's this pretty lady selling, um, you know, very nicely well-prepared um, 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 uh, medicinal products to um, the, the consumers. So there is a continuum. And we constantly need to bear this in mind as we talk about um, how to um, promote innovations and how we can make sure that the IP systems that we put in place and implement um, bring about improvement for traditional herbal medicine. Another picture, and here what I'm trying to um, point out to you are the, the diversity of innovations that are there in the sector as is being practiced today. You find that um, on top there, those shiny things are um, boilers, you know. These are still boilers that have been produced according to specification that then allows you to go before the Food and Drugs Authority 
of Ghana that has been um, um, mandated to screen all products of food and drugs that come onto our market. And so you are getting traditional herbal um, medical practitioners who would use these kinds of you know, containers so that they will be able to produce for the modern market. The next picture up there is encapsulating machines. You find capsules nicely packaged, but herbal medicines being put out on the market. And you shouldn't just think of the big enterprise herbal you know, industry that is producing this. You may find uh, a small scale or even a micro scale traditional medical practitioner who is also making this because all he has to do is to identify a facility. He goes there, he orders his products, and then he goes out to sell. So up there, you find that we have all this uh, range of products that are displayed, not just in a small corner somewhere which used to be the case some 20 years ago, but in chemical shops and pharmacies, modern chemical shops and pharmacies. All I'm trying to do at this point is to disabuse your minds of the, of the notion that when we talk about traditional medicine, we can only think in terms of the village practitioner who is in a remote corner somewhere, and therefore, you know, that is all there is to it. And whilst we are on, whilst we are on this perspective, then, sorry, I'm jumping too quickly to conclusion. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. But anyway, the point, the next point I want to make is this, that you would find that then there are opportunities for us to discuss to what extent can we bring intellectual property to bear on the current innovations, and to what extent can we open up space to address our modern development challenges, like what Dick talked about, you know, job creation. It's a huge problem here in Ghana, and of course in Africa, so is it possible to open up space for this? And in our study, we think that there are possibilities. It all has to do with what policies we put in place, what programs we put in place, because in fact, the innovation um, system can be facilitative. You know, we can, we, can, we, we can go out there with specific, you know, programs and facilitate innovation and thereby achieve specific goals um, for which we think that uh, it's essential to address these challenges. And um, I, I, I think that I would want to pause here for down. Well, that's, then, that's great. Uh, we heard a question from the floor this morning, a very prescient question about the role of trade secrets. And often trade secrets are overlooked as a type of intellectual property. And the reason that they're overlooked is because a trade secret doesn't produce a measurable output. There's no, there's no metric that you can count in terms of uh, trade secrets. So I'd like to come back with some questions about the role of secrecy in, in, in all of your studies. But before I do that, I want to invite Dick to comment a little bit on the systems approach that Erica was talking about and to situate your observations of the Gatsby Garage um, in Uganda, and in particular, their collaboration with Makerere University in the, in the invention of a locally suited electric vehicle. Uh, and this is, is narrated in Dick's uh, case study, chapter right. three of the book, very effectively. But perhaps you could just right. tell us a little bit about that. Actually, I think I should talk more about my case study. Um, I did uh, my case study on uh, automotive industry in Uganda. Is that one? Yep. And um, uh, basically try to understand how a formal institution, like a university, uh, interacts with the informal sector. Because oftentimes when we think about university in research, we are talking about university to industry in the formal, you know, formal to formal, yep. which we, we would call a horizontal interaction. So I wanted to understand the interaction that happens uh, vertically. Think about the institution, formal institution up here, and the informal sector below. So what, what kind of collaboration or interaction happens between these two sectors in that context. And um, so I picked on um, the College of 
Engineering Design, Art and Technology at Macquarie University uh, because they have created a structure where uh, within their transport and uh, I think it's called Transport Research Center, where they interact with the informal sector through an intermediary, which is a sort of a garage, um, where you have students who are part of the, you know, completing their studies at the university, as well as informal sector artisans that are recruited to come to the garage and work there. So they have been able to do a lot of work in various projects, uh, both within the automotive industry and beyond. But I think the most interesting is this project around the electric vehicle, which was uh, um, uh, produced by the, by, the, by the college about a year ago. And um, when I read about this project, uh, I was obviously fascinated. I was interested in understanding what, what are the IP issues that these folks are dealing with, the researchers. But it, as I tried to dig deep, I found out that actually the story that has been told of you know, researchers uh, producing this car was actually half the story. What has actually happened is that they designed the car, but a lot of parts, uh, um, when you think about the body and other parts of the car, were actually fabricated by the informal artisans. Okay, so my question was, okay, how do they interact? How do they find out who is involved in which part of the automotive industry? And how do they actually make use of the knowledge that exists in the informal sector? So I decided to take a social network analysis approach, which really allows you to make connections. Uh, so I, I start at McKay University and ask them, who are these people in the informal sector that you actually work with on this particular project? So I was able to create not so much complex, uh, but a reasonably good um, network to see the kind of connections uh, amongst the research at the university, as well as the informal artisans in the informal sector. And um, what was interesting, at least in IP terms, is the fact that the folks the artisans, like in the other sectors in the, that George and Eric are talking about, are not so much interested in IP, you know, obtaining IP, whether it is patenting or things of that nature. They are excited about being acknowledged as part of that project, you know. But when I, what I found out from the folks at the university is that they are reluctant to actually acknowledge the contribution of those artisans. And um, obviously, the folks at the university, uh, they understand the IP infrastructure and the implications of their work in terms of, of IP. So they have been able to identify areas that, where they can actually patent their technology. And they have actually taken steps to do that. However, they signed memorandum of understandings with the informal artisans. Uh, before they shared their technology in order for them to produce those parts, okay? So the university is protected uh, in that their technology is not going to be appropriated by the informal sector artisans because of the MOUs they have signed with them. But at the same time, the institution is not acknowledging the kind of contribution the artisans are making. Because for them, they think that they did the designing and these folks are just simply reproducing what, uh, but we know when you talk about innovation, the idea of translating a design into a product is really innovation in and in of itself. You know, there, there's a whole other interesting story to be told about, about this uh, issue, which is that um, the intellectual property that Macquarie uh, controls stems from publicly financed um, research, uh, which right. is a, a, a topic of, a, of, a, of an entire discussion uh, this afternoon in a cluster of chapters in the book. Uh, before then, I'd invite Erica. Can you share with us a, a story that sticks out in your mind, something that's um, you know, particularly applicable to this discussion from your case study, from your observations? Um, uh, well, I, I can share a story with you. It's a, a, I, the, well, the, the, the truth is that uh, during the fieldwork, um, 
We actually uh, managed to get a very interesting uh, new, not new, but a very interesting clear view of, uh, of uh, the informal economy. You know, it's, it's usually portrayed as people that don't want to pay taxes and they just want to stay away. <laughs> Basically, you know, doing something that's a little bit, uh, um, you know, there's, there's very little understanding and it's usually linked to criminal activity in some way. Um, and what we found in doing the fieldwork is that uh, the informal economy is full of stories of resilience and uh, creative application of, uh, of uh, ideas to, to solve, uh, to overcome uh, obstacles, uh, and uh, in, in, especially of, uh, of apl applying these ideas in a very harsh environment, uh, and entrepreneurship as well. Basically, um, especially in this, in this uh, sector that I was, that I was looking at, uh, there was a very interesting gender component as well, mm. <clears throat> because uh, especially in the area of cosmetics and uh, and so on, ladies uh, are more interested in in the they know the product, they know the demand, they know the market, and they usually engage in this activity more easily than than men. Although you find men as well, but uh, the gender component is another issue that I probably won't be able to make justice. But it deserves really to be to be talked about in the in the in the formal economy. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, basically, let me tell you the story about this uh, uh, lady. It's, a, it's in, a, in an area of uh, Soweto, many people here will know it, um, but it's a, it's, it's a particularly neglected area uh, in Soweto, which is a very, very, very big uh, area. area. Uh, but you find a lot of informal settlements there. She was uh, basically, um, she, was, she found herself that uh, her, at some point where her mother died and uh, her father left and she was at the, in her late teens and early 20s and she was responsible of a family. She had to look after a number of people. Um, she had to leave uh, her studies and she decided, okay, I need to do something with my hands. I need to produce something that I can sell. But she didn't have the skills. So somebody in the community, an old lady uh, around the corner, um, taught her how to make candles because she knew how to make candles. So by doing that with her, she learned how to mix wax and fragrance and, and things like that. She understood that she can actually do this. She understood the chemistry of it, or at least a, a basic uh, understanding of it. And she saw that she could actually apply that knowledge to make other things, like perfumes. And then she was doing moisturizers. And then she was talking to other people uh, that were doing similar products. And she was exchanging the knowledge that she had uh, for other bit of useful knowledge. And then she kind of expanded the range of, of uh, products that she could do. Uh, when I interviewed her, she could do hair food, shampoo, moisturizer, conditioner. And she had a range of uh, label-less products that she sold door to door. And she was managing to support a whole family like that. Um, I understood with her story, which was very touching. And she was full of courage and, uh, and, uh, and this. So she was very quick learner as well. You can see a lot of talent in this person. But you can see that building trust and social and cultural uh, networking plays a very important role and guides the behavior of informal entrepreneurs. And that applies also in the way knowledge is exchanged and appropriated. When I ask her, do you own this knowledge? She says, this knowledge doesn't belong to me. It's been given to me. Um, but of course, there's a fine balance between keeping the competition away <laughs> because you want to make a living and also make sure that you give something back to the community because they are there when you need them and you have to be there when they need it. So it's a very um, fine balance that needs to be found in the way uh, knowledge is exchanged and, and protected. Um, so understanding those values, I think, is very important in terms of of IP uh, if we want to, to embrace the informal economy. Very, very interesting. I see we're getting uh, ushered off stage, actually. Uh, <laughs> so, so I'm going to have to leave, uh, leave the discussion there. Um, but I'm going to encourage you all to uh, read uh, Dick's book chapter. Uh, you can see a conceptual study uh, about IP in the informal sector on, um, on uh, WIPO's website. And we're going to be releasing uh, the results of the WIPO Development Agenda project, including George's full case study, along with Erica's case study and Christopher's case study in Kenya, um, I believe at the next meeting of the Committee on Development and IP, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so in the very near future, you can look out for those. Uh, and so I think that that's it for me. And I guess uh, <laughs> Michelle will instruct us further. <laughs>